Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I love Deborah's trends, so were, those were great, and I would have loved to hear even more of them. So I'm sorry we didn't get to. My goal is to, you know, I've, everyone's been referencing millennials, millennials, as if they're sort of like aliens, aliens, they're among us. Um, so my goal is to try to explain them, as well as the next generation, because there is another one coming. Um, so to give you sort of, bless you, to all of you who are sneezing, it's okay. Um, why do they do the things they do? Where are these trends coming from, and how will they affect us? And hopefully not um, go too long, because I am... I have a lot to say. So I always like to start with a pop quiz. How long is it okay to wait before you respond to a text? <laughs> Which is why it's okay if you're texting. Okay, everyone's like, I don't know, like, oh, two seconds? <laughs> okay, you and my son have a lot in common. Um, okay, it's a little better than that. For Gen Ys, who we would say are about 20 to 34, one in four would say about five minutes. Okay, which by the way is a lifetime these days. If you go down to Gen V's, who are about five to 18, now mind you the five-year-olds are not texting, they're only on iPads, um, that goes up to three in four. Now the reason why that matters is for any of you who do have teenagers and you say, put your phone away, we are at the dinner table, right? And they look at you like you're crazy. And you think they're being rude they think they're being rude to their friends. So it's not that they're trying to be rude to you, it's that they truly, truly feel that they're being rude to their friends by not responding. Because their perception and their culture is one in which it is rude to not respond within five minutes. And if they don't respond, their friends start going question mark, question mark, where are you, what happened? So that's why it's different now. And you want to judge because we lived in a different world, but the game has changed. And as someone was saying earlier that, the, you know, that her 10 year old has been around longer than the iPhone and almost YouTube, the pace of change has changed so much. So the great thing about being in trends is, it used to be that it would sort of be like, it would go one way and then it would go the other way and then go the other way. Things move so much faster now that really you have to take your judgment out of it. I do like to see sort of where we are in the audience. Sorry to out you. If you, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Who here would qualify as a boomer? Boomers are always happy. I'm a boomer, yes. And we all should be boomers. It's okay. Boomers are awesome. Who here is a Gen Xer? I'm an Xer. I'm sorry. I'm an Xer, by the way. Who's a Gen Y? Okay, we have a small number of Gen Ys. I'm surprised, usually we have a few more, but that's good, they won't hurt me when I start talking about them. And obviously, we don't have a lot of Gen Vs here, I would assume. Do we have, oh, we do, we have like one in the background. Did your mom bring you after school? Um, okay, yay. Um, now, I am calling them G at Gen V, I will explain why. I also love that my team put like, a Gen Xer as a beard. Okay, grunge is over, let it go, people. All right, I know you have heard ad infinitum about Gen X. I like to do it in context, right? I started talking about Gen X when I was young, er, younger. Um, and the thing about Gen X, this is when it all started, right? Douglas Copeland wrote a book about Gen X and saying, hey, they're different. They're not behaving the way different typical generations did. It was also the first time we started segmenting generations by not 20-year periods. Now, it's true. We are stereotyping here 46 million people in the US only. I'm primarily talking US. A lot of these trends do go globally. The younger the generations get, the more global they become. Obviously, if we're talking about a place like China, it's going to be more different than the US. US and Europe are more similar. OK, one global, bless you, now I'm done. Um, US and Latin America are actually very similar on a lot of trends. But country by country, it can really vary. Um, so that was the first time that we started doing it by about 15, 18 years. Now, obviously, if you are 15 at the time a generation is coined and you are 16 at the time a generation is coined, you're not going to be entirely different. 
But what we are trying to do is say, what are the factors that affected this generation growing up that would make them feel a certain way, react in a certain way, as marketers behave in a certain way, or as retailers behave in a certain way? So we know that we are taking sort of a wide swath across them. But really, if you're then doing it by about 15 years, it's a little bit better than doing it by 20 years, but it is hard to say exactly where the cutoff is. I like to go back to Generation X because I think this is where some of the stereotypes happened and where we started to get a little bit confused. The ultimate stereotype of Generation X was, if you look back, they're slackers, they don't want to commit to anything, they're the grunge generation. Yes and no. What happened with Generation X is, is that really they were a generation where what happened was, sorry, what happened was they grew up in a world where the rules changed. And by the way, this is not a competition. It is not as if one generation had it better or worse than the other. They all had different experiences. Because if you look at it through the lens of a competition, obviously you could say, gee, these guys are having it worse. So for this generation, one and two had families who, that ended in divorce. One and two had both parents working outside the home. Yet it's not like today where the houses are right next to each other. It's cool, I get two sets of presents. My parents love each other. We go on vacation together. This was a time when divorce was strange. This was a time when having your parents divorced was a different thing. When parents were saying, hey, I'm not sure I really liked having kids. I'm gonna leave a box of cereal, good luck. I'm gonna go see what life is like. It was a very different thing. On top of that, they were supposed to be the product of the free love generation, right? So this was a generation where at 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, suddenly they were experimenting, doing lots of great things, but then all of a sudden AIDS hit. So you can see lots of mixed messages happening. This was not the generation where a man landed on the moon. This was the generation where the challenger blew up. So all of a sudden you can see these patterns emerging of you have this great family, no, it goes away. You have this great world, no, it might collapse. You have free sex and free love, oh, you might get AIDS and die. So for them, it was just a question of, well, gee, what can I count on? On top of that, they grew up in the 90s when greed was good, you could make a million dollars overnight, you could make a million, or grew up in the 80s when greed was good. You know, there was Dallas, there was Dynasty. By the way, my one Gen V is like, what is this woman talking about? She is speaking a different language. Um, in the 90s, not only could you not make a million dollars because the recession hit, but you shouldn't want to. In the 90s, it was about back to basics. Life is simple. Greed is bad. Milka was in jail. Boski was in jail. So again, this generation, it wasn't that they did, were slackers and didn't want to work and didn't want to commit. It was that they didn't want to commit to the wrong thing. So they would go to law school and they would drop out. They would get a job and think it sucked. They would go to work at McDonald's and say, this isn't very fulfilling, which is why we had the first bounce back generation that wound up back in their family's houses saying, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And their parents were the first generation that said, not get out of my house, get a job and get married, but don't make the same mistakes I did. Find a job you're passionate about. Find something that you care about. Find someone you're in love with. And that's actually a little bit of a pressure. They had their midlife crisis in their early 20s, not in their 40s or 50s. And that's very hard. What has happened with this generation for Generation X is they've emerged from their crisis typically focused on family which is why we're all teaching our kids Spanish in the womb and buying them designer jeans at two and focusing all of our energy on them. As retailers, it's an incredible opportunity, right? It's why we're cooking. It's why we like traditions. I don't mean to make light of it at all, but my favorite is the whole rise of old-fashioned drinks, right? We love Moscow Mules and Cosmopolitans and Manhattans because we look back into the 50s and the 60s and we say, oh my God, they all had happy hour, they had these barbecues. I mean, I know they're alcoholics, but at least they were together, right? <laughs> so it's as if we're looking for these traditions of the past and trying to bring them forward. So if you have history and you have something that you can bring back, they love it. You know what they like? Stability and tradition. You know what they like? Being told what to do. They didn't like it in their 20s. 
because they were confused. Now they want to know the right path forward. They're confused about how to be parents, they're confused about how to be successful, and they've got a world that's a little bit of a mess. Now you can't heavy hand it, I'm not telling you to really tell them, but this is a generation that's had a lot of confusion growing up and they need some guidance. So the problem is they're incredibly savvy and skeptical. This is the same generation that assumes you're going to be lying before you start speaking. So that's where authenticity and transparency comes from. Because you can't promise them the world, you can't promise them miracles, that's a little bit of Gen Y, we'll get to that. But if you tell them why something works, or why you're doing it differently, or why something is a lower price, then they go, oh, okay, maybe I'm in. So this generation has come out of their midlife crisis. And by the way, if they don't have kids, their family is their friends. Their family might be their workmates. So they need a small group. All of the activism, that is not Gen X. Gen X is very focused on their small universe. It's not even their community. It is their small group. So don't talk to the crowds for them. Talk to their small world. Okay, let's talk about Gen Y. Very, very different. Much bigger generation. Marketers confused by Gen X, don't like Gen X. They seem a little unhappy, right? These guys, bigger generation, more like the boomers. Let's talk to them. By the way, mostly more of the children of the boomers. These are the, if you're talking about millennials, by the way, you are not talking about teenagers. You are talking about people in their 20s and now early 30s. Um, when people typically are talking about millennials, however, it's not all roses, right? The typical thing they like to say about them is, oh, sorry for my young person in the back. Um, oh my God, they are so entitled. They come to work and after three weeks, they want a raise and they want my job. And they, don't, they want to get out of work at five to go to yoga and they want to come in at 10. And they think they know everything and they think they do it better than me, right? Well, guess what? It's not their fault. It's their parents. Because that's what happens when you give them a gold star for going to the potty and a trophy for not participating and telling them that they are fantastic every day of their life. And as marketers, we did it too. Buy one, get one free. Here's an alternate ending. Come into my store and I will give you a concert. And now, 10 years later, we're mad at them. <laughs> we made our bed. We have to lie in it. As Xers, we're like, oh, great, a recession. Now they're going to be pissed. No, they're not. They're like, it's all right. We'll just sell stuff on eBay <laughs> or make stuff and sell it on Etsy. We're like, wait, what? You can do that? How are you doing that? That's totally unfair. I don't want to portray them as naive and um, happy about everything. They're not. They're not stupid. These guys are actually more savvy than Gen Xers because they've seen it all too. You cannot put kids on leashes and walk them to school every day and make sure that they are overprotected and not have them know that there are problems out there. They have a huge amount of anxiety. It's just that like when your partner is in a bad mood and you have to be in the in a good mood, they are the good mood counter to the bad mood of Gen X. And they have chosen to see the positive where we have seen the negative. That is the positive of the entitlement. That is the empowerment. That is the, you guys are amazing. You guys are excellent. The problem, however, is if you read any parenting books, which clearly this entire generation didn't, um, of parents, it's okay, um, is that what happened is, is if you say to a, if a child brings you a piece of paper with a brush stroke on it, and you go, oh my God, that is the most beautiful painting I have ever seen. You are Picasso, that is amazing. My child is so gifted. The child stops working. If you say, that's beautiful, do you wanna add some more detail? The child keeps going. For the most part, this is a generation where everyone was told they were Picasso. So now they're having to relearn and retrain themselves in a universe where there aren't any jobs, where they're not being told they're so fantastic and it's hard. And here's the other thing. When it comes to social media and being influencers and having a lot of power, 
they are Picasso. They do have the power. So when it comes to, you know, I was in a meeting with a movie company the other day, and in fact, I had my <laughs> millennial with me, and she was t talking to the head of marketing about geofilters on Snapchat. It was like she was speaking Greek because he wouldn't value the people in his company who understood this stuff. He knew who he should be doing stuff on Snapchat. He just didn't really understand what. You have to value that side of them. Their entire life is a mashup. They're in, they are looking for things to come together. Again, I think that Deborah talked to the retail trends more than I ever could, and you know, I have some of them in here, and it's funny that we're all using so many of the same examples. But the outcome for them then is the beauty is they are optimistic, not all the time, but it is built in them. They want to see the positive side. Um, it's amazing. They'll look at movies, they'll look at history, and they'll go, yeah, but couldn't Kennedy not get shot? <laughs> couldn't he just like live? Um, they want things to be okay. They wanna believe things are going to be okay. So they don't wanna actually hear that bad things are happening. Um, they don't wanna see the negative. Not that they don't know it exists, but they know all too well it exists. So they don't need to be presented with it more than they already are. As I said, they have a plan B. They don't get a job, all right, I'll go backpacking for like $5 a day, right? They're okay with it. So don't expect them to take the traditional path in the same way that Gen X is looking for that or is evolving towards that. And people say to me, well, duh, this is like life stage. They're in their 20s, they're in their, you know, Gen X is in their 30s and 40s. No, it's not. These guys are not going to get cable when they move into houses because they don't think they're going to buy houses. They're not necessarily ever going to buy cars because they don't want that commitment. You have people who literally have their personal belongings in storage because they don't want the commitment because it costs them too much money, right? They don't need the same things that you may need. So you have to rethink about the kind of things that you're going to sell to them and how you're going to sell if their entire lifestyle is not built around getting married, having a full-time job, having a full-time career, and moving toward that. And I know you're thinking, oh yeah, but she's talking about like those people in LA and those people in New York and those like bleeding edgers, right? No. Yes, of course, there are lots of people who are, have traditional lifestyles and traditional things that are going on. But I promise you, even those people in the middle of Alabama are thinking a little bit differently, okay, about how and what success is looking like. Okay, it's not that ominous, people. <laughs> um, they're incredibly powered by the group. The physical um, scope of classrooms changed. It went from being in a line to being in a center. Everything was about group or we could go to that extreme. Um, everything went from going, being in a, you know, the individual to being in a group. Group therapy, um, group activities. It's not about the I and win, it's about being in a team. If you were too good on the soccer field, they take you off. We don't keep score. We don't know who wins. Oh my God, every kid from the age of three keeps score and knows who wins. Um, yet they crave filtration. There is too much out there for them to keep track of. So if you help them know what are the four things in your big box that they should be buying today, they will appreciate it because they can't keep track. They want to know what's important. You're like, yeah, I'd like to know what's important in this presentation because you talk really fast. Okay, let's go to Gen V. These are the young ones. 5 to 20, 5 to 18, around there. Big generation two. Um, children of X and Y. No one can pick a name for them yet. We like Gen V for Gen Viral. If it doesn't go viral, it doesn't really matter to them. The government likes to call them the Homeland Generation. I'm like, yeah, they don't watch Homeland. They don't have Showtime, okay. Um, I, Gen Z is such a Gen X name for them. They're the last generation, there are no more generations, the world is ending. The plurals, I don't even get that one, but whatever. Um, a few things about these guys, 
probably someone said this earlier, they are on, someone said 10 devices. These guys are on three devices at once. Their computer, their phone, maybe a game, or a tablet. Okay, so when you're thinking about getting their attention, you are never ever getting their full attention. So if you are creating intricate, elaborate stories or messages, good luck. Send one message, and that's it. And if they get it, you're lucky. 55% talk to their phones. They think Siri is a person. They like to chat with Siri, okay? So they are, the point is you can create dialogue with them because they are willing to create dialogue with their phone, okay? That's how desperate, desperate they are to communicate. 70% always or often sleep with their phone and the rest would want to because 79% show emotional distress when they are away from their devices because it is that connection to their friends that is so important. Their fear that they are missing something. People say, oh, FOMO, that's like gone. Oh my God, no, it's not. Their fear of missing out on something is palpable. They are afraid that they are missing out on something big, let alone chronicling something big and getting the credit for it. If Gen Y had anxiety, these guys are so aware of all the bad things going on in the universe. When people say, well, there aren't any more shark attacks. It's just that we see more shark attacks. Okay, but we see more shark attacks. And we see more tornadoes, and we see more fires, and certainly we see more attacks by ISIS and terrorists, etc. So these guys see all that. Plus, they see all of the fundraisers and 5Ks that they're put in for every physical disease that they might get. <laughs> so while Gen Y had saved the Earth, they have saved everything. And while it's wonderful, because we do have amazing kids who are doing amazing things at age 12, and not, you're like, yeah, well, I built a company. And they're like, yeah, well, I cured cancer. I'm like, okay, that's cool too. Um, think of what that does to a kid at age eight, to see all of that. Also, you've got Gen Xers who are confused as parents and we've got a lot of confusion in the world, right? Should they be on devices, which is awesome because you can take a shower. And then we've got, no, they should be playing with wood blocks, the beauty of play. So you're like, here, go have, it, have your iPad so mommy can go get clean and then take, take away the device and please go outside and only play with things that don't have plastic. It's confusing, it's really confusing. It is amazing that this is a generation that does not see color and race the way we do. I don't like to use my own kids as examples because that's not where we do most of our research in my backyard, although it is kind of handy. We do tons of research online, in person, et cetera. But um, my daughter, when she was about seven, came home and said, are we just white? And I said, yeah. And she said, no, like 100% like white. I said, yeah, dad's English, I'm kind of just white. She goes, is there like anything we can do about that? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, there's nothing. Um, it is not that cool to be just white right now. So for them, it is a world that is very, very different. That is amazing. However, that does not mean that being different is dead, right? We talk about all the bullying online. We talk about all the problems. Again, it is wonderful that we are sensitized to it. We are also overly sensitized to it, okay? So to some degree now, these kids know how much bad and evil is out there that they can and might do. Parenting has changed. It used to be that parents were the flow of information. You decided when you talked to your kids about drugs and sex and issues in the world. Now that your children at very young ages have access to devices, you are an ATM and a chauffeur, okay? You have lost control. And the challenge is that you don't know what your children know, your children know that it has changed the game fundamentally. Again, I, I used to say, 
and that's a shame. It's not a shame. It's just different. I wish that schools would stop calling history, history. Kids do not care about the past. Kids care about today and tomorrow. And if they would start teaching things in reference to today and the past, kids would be a lot more interested. And instead of calling the Today Show the Today Show, they should call it the Tomorrow Show because people would care a lot more because we are a culture that is obsessed with the future. We no longer value what has happened in the past. We no longer care about experience. We only care about the now. I do worry about relationships. I worry about sexuality and I worry about relationships because I truly believe that there is a problem with how kids are connecting with each other. If you talk to children psychologists, and there's a wonderful woman named Wendy Mogul who's written some great books on parenting and, and children, we've talked a lot about how what's happening is, is that, and again, kids have always had phone conversations and all of that, but they have these intense conversations by text. And yet what's happening is, is that they're not having the relationships that they used to have in dating at young ages because they don't want to experiment. They're afraid to risk the dating that they used to date because they no longer have to commit to anything more than 10 minutes in advance because they just text. So they don't make plans in advance and they do do everything in groups. And typically they are fooling around not with a boyfriend and girlfriend, but with a friend because they want to get it over with and they want to see what it's like. So they're not having the heartbreak that you would have in your teenage years. So they're actually having their first real romances in their early 20s. And since there is no expectation, in fact, there's a preference to delay getting married, everything is happening later. And yet, women often do want the emotional and the commitment earlier. The men are quite happy playing video games. Sorry, I don't mean to generalize. That's actually very unfair. And so there's a real disconnect. It is very true and proven that is this, this is the most, oh, not, not overly, this is the most medicated generation in history. I think it's wonderful when kids are given medication to help them with issues that they have. I have no problem with that. I think it's unfortunate that often parents are using medication as a way to help their kids with grades and believe that 24-hour happiness is the standard. I don't think that kids today are allowed to be unhappy, and I think that the stress level of kids today is at such a high level that it's truly unfortunate. Wow, aren't you so happy they invited me here? Aren't you like so excited? But I had a rainbow in my picture, so okay. Um, okay, moving on. The great news about this generation is they think so differently than we do. They really do. They, it's not about thinking out of the box. They're like out of the planet. So they are going to come up with things that we never could. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a little bit of a bumpy ride for all of Oh, wait. Um, it's going to be a bumpy ride because things are different now. Relationships are different. Jobs are different. Technology is different. They're not going to follow the same paths that we did. Jobs, everything is going to change. They're not going to march. They're going to have hologram marches. OK, I'm cool with that. Tear down the building. Um, they are afraid to commit. So you're like, oh my god, so they're not going to come to my store every week? Yeah, it's OK. They'll come in. They'll come out. Figure out ways to make them loyal, because they like to go in and out of things. And the good news is, you can make a lot of mistakes. They forgive, and they forget. Why else would Lindsay Lohan still have any sort of a career? Or Britney Spears. They're OK with it. They get that people make mistakes. Risk. Take risks. I know it's hard when you're in big organizations and you have lots of people to report to and you don't want to get fired. But for this generation, it's more important to risk than to, to try. 
They are social beasts. They are doing everything. They are on everything. We could spend every, all our time on that. They also have multiple personalities, which is why they can shop at multiple places, because they are different people in different times. They're not schizophrenic, but they like trying on different personalities. How great an opportunity is that for you? It means that they will change their hair color, their dresses, their music preferences, their rooms, everything as much as they can, because they like being consumers. They like buying and they like trying it out as much as they can. I think they are going to be a rebellious generation. We haven't had a rebellious generation in two generations. Gen X was too busy having their midlife crisis. Gen Y is so optimistic. They did have Occupy Wall Street, but that's like, can we sit here and order some pizzas? We'll clean up, we promise. Um, whatever. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, just to give you a few sort of trends as we see them, because you're like, OK, you've now told me three generations. I have to sell to all of them. How the hell do I do that? OK, the thing is you look for the commonalities. What are the things that appeal to all of them? Because it's often about their mindset too, right? Not just their age. Um, the great thing is, is there are so many trends, as Deborah and everyone else have talked about, that do appeal to so many people. Um, OK, enough with everybody rating you. You rate them, right? It's like. The only reason, I mean, I'm, I'm nice, I'm relatively nice, but like I sit in the Uber <laughs> like this, I'm like so overly polite, God forbid he give me a, like a four star and they not pick me up so I can't get to the airport. You can rate your consumer. You can give them extra access based on how much they shop and how they behave in your store and things that they do for you. People are obsessed with their own personal ratings and their own personal brands. Everyone thinks they're a brand. Everyone is unbelievably narcissistic. Um, people, if you're not familiar with it, is basically Yelp for people. It's a dating thing. So start taking advantage of this new reverse rating system. As I was sort of saying at the be beginning, they want you to work hard for their money. And you're starting to do that. But whether it's the Domino's Pizza Tracker, whether it's a train system, and I think it was Sweden, somewhere like that, um, where literally if the train breaks down, they tell you what they're doing to fix it. If it's, if it's two minutes late, they tell you why, they tell you where it is. Tell them what you're doing. That is the transparency that they're looking for. They wish you did more to help. Oh, you know, here's the other thing. There is this, it, people will always tell you they want you to do good things for the environment. They'll always tell you they want you to do more. You also know that they just want stuff to be cheaper. But they do these days want you to do good things. So unfortunately, your job is just a little harder than it ever was. Um, it's all about the surprise. It's all about the experience. It's all about making them feel like you are fulfilling this excitement that they have missed in their life. So how do you do something that feels great. By the time, first of all, Zoolander 2 was a bad idea from the start. Sorry if there's anyone here from Zoolander. Um, but, uh, but things feel over before they happen. The buildup now is very, very short. So the idea, OK, I don't know if there's anyone here from Neiman Marcus. I love Neiman Marcus. Neiman Marcus, I spent a lot of time there, a lot of money. Um, they put their Christmas decorations up September 18th, two years ago. That's a lot of buildup. Okay, by the time it happens, it feels over. Be very, very careful of that. Um, whereas Burberry, a couple of references have been made to that. Making their uh, couture stuff available the minute it hits the runways is very smart for them. Having surprise drops of albums is a lot easier than surprise unannounced releases, but it's important to them. Having a purpose. By the way, your purpose can be, we're all about fun. Your purpose can be, we're crazy and rich. I always said Paris, the, the Paris Hilton was fine until she started reading like spiritual books. Upside down, by the way. One was a picture of her doing it upside down. No one wants her to be spiritual. No one wants her to have a, you know, look like she's having a purpose. They want her to be rich, buy stupid things, and act stupid. Her purpose has to be that. Be one thing and do it well. <laughs> um, having said that, do put things together that they didn't expect. So um, an airline, again, I'm just going to say Sweden. It's not, but it's my favorite country right now for some reason. Um, having, using a bag of chips 
as your boarding pass. Putting things together, also compare, sort of saying travel isn't that big a deal. It doesn't have to be so serious. Take a trip for fun. Our, our flights are not that expensive. Putting objects on shirts that you wouldn't expect to to show that things can mix together that wouldn't normally. McDonald's hiring an extremely um, famous chef um, in China to do a burger that you wouldn't expect and then having people pay what they wanted to, what they thought the burger was worth to sort of say, we're going to twist your perspective and show you something different. A couple of people have talked about virtual reality um, and giving people the opportunity because, you know, Bill Gates had that great quote of people overestimate the change that happens in five years and underestimate the change that happens in 10. We are in that five to 10 with virtual reality where it's finally gonna sort of take off and people are going to feel comfortable with it. Nobody likes wearing that headset until you're actually kind of in that headset and have great content, but it's about the content itself. Um, and if that content feels like a good experience. But having said that, it's not just about the content. These days, it's about the context. So making it feel like you know me where I am and when I am there. So as I said before, a geofilter. So Lily Pulitzer are doing a special geofilter so that when you're in there, you can have your geofilter match the dress, right? 79%. 74% of adults actually want an offer based on where I am. They're saying, get me. We want you to know me. I want, who doesn't want to feel understood? Um, they want you to use their information to give them more information. I just thought I'd give you a couple of, and again, a couple of these have been mentioned before, um, of just a couple of things we like and we think, or people we think are doing it well. Adidas take on love to take a stand. We know it's controversial, but when you take a stand, even if you get flack for it, stand up for what you believe in. So Adidas showing, obviously, implying that someone is kissing. A Kia flat for hire where they basically outfitted an entire apartment so that you could go in and experience an apartment and then buy things from there. Um, Barbie has done so many great things these days, but sort of recognizing that people think that they're outdated, that they're sexist, all of these things, and turning it on their head. I won't go through all of them. Just in terms of social media, as a little cheat sheet, you know, everyone likes to make fun of Facebook. Everyone like likes to call it mom book. Um, no, it's not cool, sorry, it's not. But it's big and it's relevant. And you can get a lot of people, people on it. I think Facebook Live is going to be important, I really do. Um, Instagram is very fake, it's very curated. I think one thing they could do is to give people the option to turn off the likes and the comments, but that would kill it in some way because what Snapchat does, Snapchat is so important right now to young people because it feels of the moment, it feels current. They don't want to take pictures, they just want to have people on their Snapchat. Finstagrams, if you think you're following your kid on Instagram, you're not. They have Finstagrams, which are fake Instagrams, which is really where they're putting the things that their friends see it. Um, uh, so yeah. Um, informing going on, you know, going on Twitter. I'm not going to say Twitter is kind of irrelevant to a lot of people, but I think in some cases it's just a lot of work to say something in 140 characters, but obviously now they're going to change that. Uh, in terms of just some fun, what's hot things out there, Parker Smith, Gigi Hadid's favorite brand right now. Um, you know, these are, uh, Milk is a cosmetic brand that we like because they're sort of, they've got great packaging. Um, Actually, I know I'm running out of time. I want to get to this because please use these at your own risk. Actually, don't even use them. Just know them. Just going home and saying to your kid, like, low key, I saw this girl and she just like talked really fast, but she had some good points. Bad idea. But just know when your kid says low key, they're saying to be honest. Um, Hulu and Commitment is an update on Netflix and Chill, which, as you know, meant just like come over and let's fool around. Um, for those binge watching TV shows with someone while in a relationship. So that's like, let's hang out and watch billions. Um, lip boxing, sort of throwing shade on social media. So saying something negative, kind of what I just did on Twitter and Facebook. Um, emoji tennis, just texting back and forth using only emojis. Kids will often do this if they suspect that their parents are uh, reading their text. So they will have an entire conversation 
with emojis during which you're like, oh my god, that's so cute. And they've just said something really bad about something someone's done, and you have no idea what it was. Uh, Insta lurking, going back far into someone's Instagram page so you can check out who they are, but you don't actually like it. Um, and then text soaked, a relationship based solely on text messaging. Right? So kids will be going out, but they actually don't do anything. They just text each other, which is how I prefer my children to have relationships. Um, in terms of connecting with them, please don't assume they're taking the traditional path. They can't anymore. They're not getting the jobs. They're not getting the promotions. They don't want to wait for them. They're not looking to necessarily get married. They're afraid to get married. They're afraid to commit. They can't find the people they want. They know that when they're dating, if they don't like that person, they can go home and swipe right, and swipe right, and swipe right, and find someone else. That has changed the nature of relationships. If you don't know that reference, ask someone. It's Tinder. Um, Share your message on multiple screens. I know that's hard. Budgets are cut. It is tighter than ever. But I do not think the internet is the only answer, by the way. But I think it's an important answer and an important part of the mix. Um, you have to listen to them. You don't listen to one of them. There is no one who has all of, them, all of it. And they are not your creatives. They are not your marketing people. But you should listen to what they have to say because they are important. Um, help them learn and help them gain new skills. This is really important. Everyone under underestimates how much they actually want to do stuff and learn things, whether it's through you, because of you, um, enabled by you. That's important to them. Uh, they all want to be entrepreneurs, right? They all want to run their own company. How can you help them do that? It used to be that they all wanted to be famous, and we were like, it's actually not a career. Um, so at least now, they want to be vloggers, or they want to be entrepreneurs, and they want to come up with an idea. When in doubt, I know it's old, but they do love to laugh. And it is a hard world, and it is a hard time. And if you can help them do that, they are going to appreciate you for it. Um, we are a trend company. We are a research company. We are a consulting company. We like people to stay abreast of change. We do a weekly newsletter. You are welcome to, it's free. You're welcome to sign up for it. And we do daily trends if you are interested. Do I have time for questions or? Absolutely. So if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Or not. I've covered everything. You know everything about, you know, 75 bureaus of people I've covered. Any questions? None? Not one? Oh, yes. really not ever escaping that. Like, what are your thoughts on that? What do you, what do you guys? As a consumer? Yeah, as a consumer, as, I don't know, you were talking a lot about kids too. So, so the like, question <laughs> is, it, you know, if virtual reality takes off and you, why would you ever leave your home? Why would you ever travel? Why would you ever actually meet a human being? Um, let me say one other thing, which I didn't get to today. I do worry about teen boys a lot. I think there's a huge focus on girl empowerment and, you know, go girls and fight like a girl and all that. And really, the, and I'm mad at myself for doing what I did, which is it's really easy to pick on teen boys. And the only attention that is paid to them is when they shoot up schools and that they're playing too many video games. No one is focusing on teen boys. And the only role models they have right now are superheroes or like fat guys in movies who drink beer and are comedians. It's bad. So to your question, um, I think the need to connect is a fundamental need that humans have. And even in apps, we see things like cuddle, where you can literally hire someone to come cuddle with you. Creepy, yes, but does show the need to connect. Or um, you know, uh, Lufthansa, I think it was, did a thing where you would high, it was in, I think it was Times Square, where you would high five someone from a different country so you could connect with someone. So I think the reality is that we have a, a primal need to connect with people. Do I worry that yes, we, the more we text and the more we fulfill our needs, we will stay inside? 
yeah, I do. I think that kids do stay inside more, and um, I do worry about that. But um, that train has left the station, and I think that hopefully we can find ways to maximize both. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you so much.